BBC News Channel. Good morning. Welcome to Breakfast from BBC News with me, Susanna Reid. New airport security measures are being brought in. Full body scanners are being considered. The Prime Minister acts after the Detroit plane plot. He calls it a wake-up call in the fight against terrorism. Very good morning to you. It's Friday, January the 1st. Happy New Year. Also on today's programme, the freed British hostage Peter Moore looks set to leave Baghdad later today. We'll be live there shortly. A warning that the rising number of people needing treatment for alcohol could cripple NHS hospitals. How music is helping to heal the scars of the Italian earthquake. We'll hear from one of the survivors. And celebrations in London and around the world to welcome in the new year and a new decade. First, our main news this morning, a review of airport security has been ordered by the Prime Minister after the failed Detroit plane plot, which he's described as a wake-up call. Writing on the Downing Street website, Gordon Brown says the UK will move quickly in its fight against terror. Full body scanners will now be considered as part of the new measures. The new decade is starting as the last began, with Al-Qaeda creating a climate of fear. That, writes the Prime Minister, is why there can be no complacency in dealing with it. The failed Detroit attack, he says, shows that international terrorism remains a very real threat. He says countries must urgently tighten the ways they share information on suspected terrorists to stop their movements and the review into procedures is now being carried out that will report in the next few days. New physical security measures also seem inevitable. Umar Farouk Abdul Mutalab's explosives went undetected through Dutch and Nigerian airports, and Gordon Brown says new techniques will be examined in cooperation with America, including full-body X-ray scanners. The Prime Minister also says the country can't rely on a fortress Britain strategy alone, and urges people to be vigilant in identifying people at risk of radicalisation. Ben Wright, BBC News. The freed British hostage, Peter Moore, is likely to leave Baghdad later today. That's according to British embassy sources in the Iraqi capital. He was released on Wednesday after two and a half years in captivity. Let's speak now to the BBC's Middle East correspondent, Jim Muir, who is in Baghdad. Very good morning to you, Jim. What do we know officially about when Peter Moore will be coming home? Well, Happy New Year to you too. Um, we're expecting him to move on uh, later today, but I have to say that his movements and plans are being and his desire and that of his family to have a period of decompression as he eases gently back into uh, the life and the challenges uh, that lie ahead. So we're not being told anything about the likely timings or indeed the modalities, the routes and, and aircraft that will be used to, uh, to move him back home, but uh, the expectation is that uh, he will be on the move in, in the next few hours. Jim, what do we know about um, what he's been doing since he was released and what is likely to happen to him once he returns home? Well, um, from what we understand, he's been having a quiet time. Of course, it was his second night of uh, freedom last night and it was New Year's night, but there were uh, kind of modest... Um, uh, certainly not uh, an atmosphere of revelry or anything like that at the embassy. Apparently it was a very quiet uh, evening and he's being allowed to decompress. He's having a quiet time. Obviously he's receiving uh, medical attention and counselling which is very important uh, after hostages come out of uh, captivity. Um, once he goes back uh, to the UK of course he will be reunited with his family and he'll be left uh, with them I would imagine for quite some time but of course there will also be uh, further counselling and debriefing because of course people will want to know uh, what light he can shed on the whole affair of the, the, the kidnapping which of course uh, many aspects of which remain uh, very murky. OK, Jim Muir reporting from Baghdad. Jim, thanks very much for now. A judge in America has dismissed all charges against five men from the US security firm Blackwater over the killing of 17 Iraqis. The guards were accused of opening fire on a crowd in Baghdad in 2007. The federal judge said the US Justice Department had used evidence prosecutors were not supposed to have. The National Health Service in England is struggling to keep up with a rising number of people needing treatment because of alcohol. That's the claim in a report by health service managers at the NHS Confederation. 
They say better services need to be developed in the community. This is where alcohol is putting the NHS under pressure. Ambulance crews and accident and emergency staff deal with incidents daily, patching up the damage from heavy drinking. Behind this front line, there is a less visible but growing burden of disease. Today's report says the NHS needs to pick up alcohol problems earlier when they're easier and cheaper to treat. We reckon about 90% of uh, spending on alcohol-related health problems uh, is, in, is in acute hospitals and in ambulances. Uh, we think that actually that could be uh, better spent if there was more prevention and more early uh, identification of alcohol problems. The cost of treating alcohol problems in England has risen rapidly from £1.4 billion a year in 2001 to £2.7 billion by 2007. But only one in 18 people with alcohol problems receive treatment. And many people still don't realise they're drinking above healthy levels. Believe is needed, a shift in our drinking habits to reduce the health damage from alcohol. Brown Jeffries, BBC News. Economists are warning that retailers face a tough spring as the VAT rate returns to 17.5% today. The tax was cut to 15% a year ago to help drive up consumer spending during the recession. Many businesses say they will delay passing on the higher rate. Others say they'll absorb the cost of the increase. And the suspension of stamp duty on homes worth less than £175,000 has ended. It means buyers will once again have to pay the tax on properties worth more than £125,000. The so-called stamp duty holiday was introduced back in September 2008 to help the property market. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr Rowan Williams, will describe the last decade as a terrible and gruelling period when he delivers his New Year message later today. The Archbishop will also say that the suffering and risks people face cross national boundaries. He'll urge people not to lose sight of what he calls the one enormous lesson we can learn from the last ten years. It's about not losing our hope for change and our love and respect for the dignity of everyone. In a world where risk and suffering are everybody's problem, the needs of our neighbours are the needs of the whole human family. Let's respond just as we do when our immediate family is in need or trouble. We may be amazed by the difference we can make. You can watch the Archbishop of Canterbury delivering his New Year message on BBC One at 12.35 this lunchtime and again on BBC Two at 5 o'clock this evening. It's the first day of a new decade and the year 2010 has been welcomed in with parties and celebrations across the world. In the UK, hundreds of thousands of party goers braved freezing temperatures to set the new year off with a bang. Big Ben signalled the start of the fireworks in the capital, all centred on the London Eye. Mayor Boris Johnson said the display showed the most exciting city on earth, was looking forward to the future with optimism and energy. The crowd on the embankment danced to a very upbeat Old Lang Syne. In Edinburgh, tens of thousands of people from around the world braved sub-zero temperatures to watch the fireworks over the castle and celebrate Hogmanay in real Scottish style. I love the food, I don't know why, even the haggis, haggis, oh my god, I like it, I don't know why. And we're loving the cold, you just don't get this cold in Australia. What they could have got in Australia was a display of fireworks over Sydney Harbour that was labelled the greatest. Cities around the world competed to put on the best performance. In Hong Kong, the waterfront skyscrapers provided a perfect platform for the pyrotechnics. Whilst in Moscow, fireworks lit up the sky behind St Basil's Cathedral in Red Square. Paris opted instead for a sound and light show centred on the Eiffel Tower. In the city of romance, couples celebrated in traditional style. And in Times Square, New York, America ushered in the first year of the new decade under a shower of confetti. Andy Moore, BBC News. Nine minutes past eight, that's a look at our top stories this morning. Alex Deakin will be here in about 15 minutes to tell us what's in store with the weather for this New Year's Day. Now, one of the biggest stories of the last year was the devastating earthquake which hit the Italian city of L'Aquila in April. 
More than 300 people died and tens of thousands were left homeless. In the days which followed, our correspondent Duncan Kennedy met many survivors of the quake and he's been back to see how one of them is coping. It sometimes takes immersion in sublime music to forget. To forget destruction. To forget loss of family and friends. Joanna Griffith Jones, originally from Liverpool, remembers the day her own home nearly consumed her. I will never forget, nobody here will ever forget the, the terror, the screams that night, the, 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 the loss, the, the deaths. Um, you will never, ever, ever forget it now. We first met Joanna last April in the raw hours after the L'Aquila earthquake destroyed her village. I do find it difficult seeing this, um, especially if you, you go through to the main square and the church is gone. It's such a beautiful little main square and all the houses are gone. And I just think all the people have died. We've now been back to see Jo in her chalet-style temporary home on the edge of her village outside L'Aquila. Good morning. <laughs> Here, the walls no longer sway or ceilings cascade. It's warm somewhere safe to reflect. A life-changing experience? Absolutely. Of that, there is no doubt, absolutely no doubt. Um, it, it puts so many things into perspective in, in a life, things that are really necessary, things that aren't necessary. Life-changing experience. When you remember the night in question, is there a particular smell, a noise that sets it all off again? Dust dust the smell of dust because that night as the the ceiling was collapsing in on us and the whole house was just rocking and shaking um, uh, just dust 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 and here uh, a memorial um, Joe took me to honors new garden of remembrance bathed in watery winter sunlight it's 41 names babies grandparents whole families. And then finally, onto Honor's once charming Main Street, now home to rubble, ghosts and hope. It's all, almost unbelievable, really, that a, that a village is completely wiped out. I have wonderful memories of this village, um, and I'm sure there will be wonderful memories again. But Joanna says it will need her music and the forgiving passage of time for that to happen. Duncan Kennedy, BBC News, in honour. 13 minutes past eight. Let's bring you up to date with the headlines then on Breakfast This Morning. Gordon Brown says the UK will move quickly to enhance airport security after the wake-up call of the failed Detroit plane attack. And the BBC understands the freed British hostage Peter Moore is likely to leave Baghdad later today. We've just left the decade which many dubbed the noughties behind, but what should the next 10 years be called? There have been plenty of suggestions, including the 2010s, the 10s and the teenies. Let's hear what some of you think the next decade should be named. Oh, the 2010s, definitely. 2010s? I like the deckers. No, we like the... T no, Ben and I were talking about it. 2010s. Deckers. <laughs> deckers sounds pretty good. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Why is that? A bit catchy for me anyway. I'd go with the 10s. Tens. Yeah. You think that's a catchy one? I think that's, yeah, I think it'll catch on. Um, tweens, I think. Tweens? tweens. Yep. Do you like <laughs> the tweens? Why do you think the tweens are good? I don't know. It's something a bit different. OK, Susie Dent uh, is Countdown's dictionary expert and she joins me along with Piers Fletcher, who is a producer and the chief question wrangler from the programme QI. Very good morning. Is that on your CV, no. Beard? Uh, it was for a while, yes. Chief question wrangler. Um, well, Happy New Year to you both, and Thank thanks you. very much indeed for joining me this morning. Um, Piers, just have to clarify that we're calling this a new decade, but officially, are we in a new decade? Well, I think you'd have to be one uh, really special pedant to say that we're not. And by that logic, you'd say that uh, the year 1990 was, was not in the 1990s. 
which is absurd. So I think we can call this a new decade. OK, good. I'm so happy we, with that. OK, we've, we've got that cleared up, and that's official as far as I'm concerned. Um, Susie, tell us about the noughties, yeah. because still, to me, it sounds kind of odd calling the last decade the noughties. I know, actually, my favourite nickname for the date, in fact. So it's quite interesting that it was applied retrospectively. Yeah. So I guess a, a decade has to prove itself, although Piers and I were saying we haven't been especially naughty, in fact, anything, anything but. So that was purely a sort of linguistically, you know, nice-sounding uh, nickname. But you, um, yeah. yeah. Do you think, Piers, I mean, that, that, exactly that point, the naughty sounded a bit cheeky, so perhaps people didn't want to pick up on it, but then they realised the decade was slipping past and had to call it something. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't think anyone really worries about it during the decade. It's something we look at in retrospect respect, isn't it? And uh, um, we probably won't call this decade anything at all, I'm afraid, to shoot your fox, <laughs> but, uh, until nine, ten years' time when they'll be running articles in the papers about what happened in the last decade, and by then it'll be 2019, we'll be calling it the teens. Okay. Perhaps, think? You, you think that's the most likely? Well, uh, yeah, I'm coming round to that view. The yeah. teens of the 21st century? Yeah, perhaps. So when something happens in 2015, it'll be, yeah, the mid-teens? Yeah. And the, but the other thing is, of course, if you look back at the 20th century, they didn't call the corresponding decade anything. Uh, but there was a war going on in, yeah. in that decade, and I dare say they called it the war. And maybe we'll have some, you know, we'll be calling it the floodies or the, you know, the disaster resort. Uh, so it might be defined by events, events. Yeah. yeah, rather than, than given yeah. a name. Um, Susie, apparently competition in Australia awarded the prize to the Wonder Years. Yes, I'm not that keen on that one, I have to say. One spelt O-N-E. Yeah, I suppose because at the moment it feels like they might be anything but the Wonder Years. I've, I've heard some um, similar ones as well, like... Um, the tenter hooks or, or you know, the, the sort of try and encapsulate with the sort of uncertainty that, that we're facing with. But the 2010s to me sounds quite American. It's the sort of 24-7 element. But I think Piz is right. It'll be a while before something really settles. Um, and in a recent survey of 5,000 Brits, the most popular choice of name over here was the 2010s, yeah. uh, beating off competition from the teenies, yeah. the tenties and the tenors. I tenors. think the tenties have got an outside chance. Do you? you? Okay. Go, the tenties. Don't you think? It's just a made, made up. The well, yeah. I suppose it's all kind of. I hope it'll be an exceptional it? decade. It'll be like the swinging 60s, the roaring 20s. We'll find something that really kind of gives it some oomph, uh, and it'll be a better decade that we can look back on. Does it matter at all? No. No. <laughs> is it just a talking point? Or, or, yeah. or is there something? It's a item. Is there. <laughs> what, on New Year's <laughs> Day? No. Yeah, don't put that past us. Um, <laughs> do you think that it's important for us to label? Decades no, now, well, or one of the funny years things is that now. decades don't don't fit into these. The sixties really started in 1963, as Philip Larkin pointed out, and went on till about 1974. So you know what I mean. So, you know, JFK assassinated 1963, Beatles album 1963, ending with the withdrawal from Vietnam or something like that. And so the maths doesn't necessarily tie in with the, no, I think the, that's the zeitgeist. Right. No. History's not that tidy. I think that's right. Was then the noughties would have been quite naughty. Yes, that would have been lovely yeah. had they been, but. Um, you know, they've been thrifties, really, haven't they? Yeah. And the war on terror and all those things, that, you know, that, that's what people will think of characterising this first decade. I yes. Mm. And you being chief question wrangler on QI, I mean, all these things are important because they form the basis of all sorts of things you ask people. <laughs> if we can get laugh. a laugh out of it, yes. Yeah. yeah. OK, so, well, well, where are the laughs, then? Um, well, yes, I was hoping question. to pick something up this morning. This is a research <laughs> trip for me. Is it? Yeah. OK. Oh, well, Susie and Piers, thanks ever so much for joining us. Um, okay. Lovely to talk to you. Where did you finally come down, Susie, on what are you going to call it? I just hope straightforward 2010s. To me, it's simple. 2010s. But I hope that we do get some sort of nickname, like the Roaring Twenties, but we'll have to prove ourselves first. Yes, and you're, and you're going for I'm a going defining event. A defining event, and if there isn't one, the teens, but not for, ten, not for nine or ten years. OK. Lovely to talk to you both. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Happy New Year. Thanks Thank you very too. much Thank indeed. You. OK, 19 minutes past eight, you're watching Breakfast. The uh, strains being put on the health service by excessive drinking are highlighted this morning in a new report by NHS managers and other countries are also facing up to the challenges posed by alcohol. From today, Russia has introduced a minimum price for all vodka sales in an attempt to tackle the country's drinking problem. Our correspondent, Richard Galpin, is in Moscow. Uh, and a very good morning to you, Richard. Just give us an idea of the kind of scale of the problem Russia is trying to tackle here. Oh, it's, it's absolutely uh, huge. Officially, uh, there are two and a half million registered alcoholics. But, uh, you know, many people uh, believe uh, the figure is much, much higher. There's some estimates which actually say that one in three men uh, in this country are alcoholic. And if you just look at the figures, for example, 
of the number of people who died who died from alcohol poisoning uh, every year. It's something like 35,000 people, so an enormous number, and that's just from alcohol poisoning because they're drinking horrific products, um, horrific moonshine, uh, which kills them very, very rapidly. OK, but moonshine not being targeted here. This is about um, officially sold vodka, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. The idea, of course, is to increase the minimum price, which they therefore hope will decrease consumption because people will think twice about uh, buying a bottle because it's more expensive. But the problem with that, as, as has been proved uh, in the past, is that if you do that, then more and more people are likely uh, to turn to the moonshine, which then, in fact, could increase uh, the number of deaths and the number of people who are seriously ill as a result of alcohol abuse. Because people turn, I mean, it's not just to moonshine uh, here in Russia, they turn to things like cleaning fluids, uh, to perfume, to, uh, to aftershave, anything which contains some form of alcohol. And of course, that is extremely dangerous. Mm. Uh, the government, though, with this increase of a minimum price, uh, must think that it will have some positive impact. Give us an idea of how much vodka currently costs, how much it will cost. Well, at the moment, or until now, uh, the, the minimum price or the lowest price uh, for vodka, I mean, you could pick up a bottle of vodka for less than a pound. It's now going to cost almost two pounds, which is still uh, pretty cheap for, for half a litre of vodka. But yes, you know, I mean, the government clearly thinks it has to do something. When the Prime Minister has described, al has described alcoholism in this country as a national tragedy, you know, and they're particularly aware because one of the key problems in this country is the fact that the population is declining at a very rapid rate, according to some statistics, by about three quarters of a million people per annum. So they have to do something to tackle the health crisis in this country. And that means, of course, tackling alcoholism. But I think many people will be very sceptical about whether this initial measure will actually have any impact. And Richard, what is the feeling there about why Russia has this particular problem with alcohol consumption? It's a very good question, but I guess, you know, it's tradition, um, it's culture, it's in the literature, and it's, you know, it's pretty much institutionalised. You know, if you go out, I mean, at any level, I mean, if you go and meet top officials, then, you know, the probability is if you go for dinner with them or go to some kind of function, you'll sit down and you'll, actually you'll stand up and toast or have many toasts with vodka. I mean, people just do it. It's something in the Russian soul, perhaps connected to the climate as well, and it's a tough place, and some people need some kind of escape. But, you know, this is nothing new in this country. It's been going on uh, for centuries. Richard Galpin, uh, reporting there from Moscow. Thanks very much indeed, Richard. Sally. We can polish our halos, can't we? We can. You were Very in bed well at behaved. 10 and I had two sips of wine at midnight and went straight to sleep. Very well behaved indeed. And yeah. an exciting day for sport because first day of the new year means the new transfer window has opened. It's a bit early yet to be talking about signings, but Tottenham manager Harry Redknapp says Roman Pavlichenko is welcome to leave with one condition. They have to recoup most of the £13.8 million they paid Spartak Moscow for him at the start of last season. Redknapp isn't keen to let him go, but the player has made no secret of his desire to leave Spurs. He hasn't played since October. If he wants to leave and somebody comes in and pays the money for him that he's worth, then, you know, we'd have to look at it. But uh, he's not one that we're looking... I'm not, I'm not sort of crazy to shift him out of it. He's a good player again. He's a, he's a talented footballer. Has he spoken to you about wanting to leave? I just chatted with him a couple of weeks ago, yeah. Um, and he said he's, he's you know, he, he felt he, he wanted to move and this, that and the other. So, but it's up to somebody who's got to come and make an offer that, that you know, the club accepts and is, is a good enough offer for us to even look at it. Otherwise, it, there's, no, there's no chance of, doing a, uh, of him leaving. Well, the uh, Birmingham manager, Alex McLeish, is not keen on the transfer window, saying it encourages panic buying. Although he was promised around £40 million by the new club's owner, McLeish doesn't intend to splash out. Birmingham are in a comfortable position. I'm sure that when you are hovering above the, the relegation zone or in the relegation zone that, um, that you, you start to make rash decisions and, and panic and maybe make a, spend more money than, than you should. And that's why the, the January window, I'm not particularly a great fan of it because uh, people do, it is a panic buy window. We are in a position now where I don't have to spend anywhere near the, the money that uh, was mentioned when the, the new owners came in. We 
we can be prudent, we can make sure we do our diligence and try and bring two or three players that will keep us ticking over nicely. Now, with the start of the Six Nations Championship just over a month away, there's a major worry for Wales after fly half Stephen Jones picked up a shoulder injury in the Scarlet's Celtic League win at Newport Gwent Dragons. The 14 9 victory was their first away from home all season. After a cagey opening quarter of an hour to this match, it was Newport Gwent Dragons who broke the deadlock. Fly half Sean Connor with a drop goal, which finally got the scoreboard moving. The Scarlet's response was immediate, though. Centre Jonathan Davis powering through the midfield before offloading to Rhys Priestland, whose try put the visitors in front. The lead then changed hands four more times either side of the break as Connor landed two penalties for the Dragons, who were bidding to maintain their unbeaten home record this season. And Stephen Jones did likewise for the Scarlets, who just aren't used to being so close to the bottom of the table. Jones' afternoon came to a premature end when he was forced off by a shoulder injury sustained earlier in the match, and that'll be of concern to the whole of Wales, with the Six Nations just five weeks away. A Priestland penalty then extended the Scarlets' lead to five points, but the visitors were forced to withstand a Dragons' onslaught right to the end. Only when this effort was held up in the sixth minute of stoppage time could the Scarlets finally celebrate their first away win of the season. Colm Harrison, BBC News. And uh, coming up later today, we'll be hearing from the England cricket camp in Cape Town. They're in the nets today. Victory in the third test would, of course, win them the series. And that starts on Sunday. That's just about all the sport from me. Have you got any New Year's resolutions yet? Uh, be a bit healthier, I think. What about you? Yeah, they're boring ones, aren't they? Yeah, We've sorry. Got... <laughs> mine, mine is be more organised. Um, eat less chocolate. Uh, eat, eat more chocolate. Oh, eat more chocolate. Yeah. Is that yours? Yeah, yeah, that's mine. Okay. <laughs> Fine. That's probably quite an easy one to stick to, isn't it? <laughs> Sally, thanks very much indeed. And uh, let's get a look at the weather now with Alex. Thanks very much, Susanna. Good morning to you and a 